You're listening to the Good Question Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Our goal is to make each of our guests exclaim, Hmm, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Because when that happens, it means you, the listener, may be inspired to learn more beyond the interview and to ask great questions yourself that lead to new insights. In this podcast, we cover historical and current anthropology, comparative religion, and history. Welcome, and let's get started. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the the Good Question podcast. Uh, Today, I have Ayel Aviv. He's an assistant professor at uh, Columbian College of Art Sciences. We're going to talk talk about Buddhist philosophy and uh, intellectual history. So, Ayel, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I've spoken to people of the, uh, you know, the Jewish faith, uh, Christian faith, Catholic faith, etc., but Buddhist, not yet. Tell me a bit about your your journey. How did you first learn about Buddhism and uh, and study it? So my journey actually started with growing in in Jewish, Christian, and Muslim faiths around me. I was born in Israel, and I spent most of my young adult life in in Jerusalem. I lived there for seven years. So I was surrounded by uh, people who were practicing Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. I was really trying hard to find uh, find my way and understand why people are so excited. So I I learned those traditions. I I met with uh, Christian monks and with Jewish rabbis, uh, but never found myself completely inspired by uh, by what I've heard and met. So as a young person, I got really interested in reading broadly in different philosophical tradition and was really attracted to Asian religions. There was before it was a time before the internet, so the early nineties, and there's not a whole lot of Buddhism back then in Israel. So I had to. Um, find curiosity in whatever literature was available. And eventually I decided to, to travel to Asia um, and, and learn from, from Buddhists themselves. So I, in 1993, I traveled to, uh, to Thailand and stayed in a monastery for a couple of months and did an intensive meditation retreat. That completely upended my world. And, and I, it was an, an eye-opening experience, to say the least. I wanted to stay there more, but my parents were very concerned that I'm on a way to become a monk. So I, out of concern for the well-being, I, I left and went to China and studied there for about uh, six months in a university in Sichuan province. Fell in love with the culture. And when I get back to Israel, came back to Israel, I integrated both. And I did a BA focusing on East Asian philosophies and cultures, uh, especially on Buddhism in China. And then um, after so that, what- I did... Oh, oh, one sorry. quick question here: What what are some of the um, the tenets of Buddhism that appear to be universally known or are important for people to understand? You know, when they, I would, I would guess most people don't know much about Buddhism except Buddhists themselves. So, for listeners that don't know anything about it, what are some of the main tenets of Buddhism? Um, so, Buddhists Buddhists start from the point of view that suffering, or in the most subtle way, disease is a universal phenomena for everything that, that exists, including us humans, but not only humans. And the major project of a, on the Buddhist path will be to alleviate the, the suffering or the disease for ourselves and for others. And the path that leads there is really what this tradition developed over thousands of years. Uh, so people on this path are engaging in all sorts of practices to uh, to increase the well being of their own of themselves their communities and the world as a whole. Okay, well, what are some of the what is it about Buddhism that attracted you when you when you started studying it? You know, versus other religions or other uh, thinking so systems. Personally, that we so just uh, just a bit of a of a of a background. I you know grew up in in time of conflict in the Middle East, which is a bit of a interesting thing to say about a, a region that is strife with conflicts all the time. But what, what attracted me was uh, reading about the wisdom of some of those Buddhists, and, and not just Buddhists, but also figures from other traditions in Asia that uh, exude this kind of wisdom, uh, and, and the, the kind of calm and equanimity that was very attractive for me as a young person who just finished his army service and was full with doubts and with, with emotions and confusion. And reading it was therapeutic to me, um, really on, on an existential level. I, I had... I was dealing with a lot of uncertainties and anxieties, and just reading about that was so soothing. The 
the stories, uh, the, the history of some of those people, the biographies and the way that they see the world seem to be so, so different from what I grew up with. Uh, so I can talk about several examples of how this worldview is, is different from the kind of mainstream that a lot of us are used to in, in our part of the world. Uh, and it was, it was just fascinating for me. So I, I, felt, I felt curiosity and attraction to learn more. Uh, and that's what drew me to the temple, and that's what drawing me to. Yeah, the tell me about tell me about the. Uh, oh, sorry, about go ahead and repeat that. You said you you went at a temple. Uh, so I, I was just saying that this this was the the driving force that drew me to these traditions and and drawing me ever since because I keep learning and studied those texts uh, and learning from these teachers ever since. Well, again, what have you learned, and how has it been useful in your life? What, what's an example of you? One of the insights that animate the tradition is the understanding that we are that we tend to see ourselves as a subject that are somehow perceiving the world as out there as and we see object in the world as uh, as as represented by our minds, but they're outside of us. And the Buddhists think that the Buddhists tend to think that this is an illusion, right? that the world is uh, is other than that. They they tend to think that the world is co- uh, that, that we are co-created with the world. So, in, in other words, there is there is a deep l- level of uh, relationality between who we are uh, at the most fundamental way and the world around us. This is this leads to um to an opening in which we can. Uh, envision a world that uh, that will be d- different from the world that we are envisioning right now. So that has uh, interesting social and even political implications uh, that we can develop if there is an interest. At the most fundamental existential level, it means that the self, right, and the selfhood, the individual, which is so important for a Western civilization, is perceived not as a thing, but rather than rather than that as a process or a set of processes that operate always in connection to the world at large. So we are embedded in a world. And although we experience, uh, experience ourselves as separate, uh, we are uh, with the, the meditative practices and with the contemplative exercises that are that, that develop in home for thousands of years, Buddhists could learn to see themselves as deeply embedded in the world and feel themselves much more connected than, than many of us are feeling in, in this this time has this been useful to you in your in your upbringing in your you know your daily life there's a new book that uh, just came out recently by the neuroscientist Anil Sev uh, and he said it pretty nicely he said that every time science has displaced us from the center of things it has given us back uh, far more in return and I think that uh, that it's true also in for for Buddhism once we are not in the center of everything it changed it changed my moral perspective it, it's I, I stopped seeing myself as a center of of my universe, and instead I, uh, saw myself as connected very deeply to my community, to uh, to my family, and to the world as a whole, to nature. And uh, this this notion of separateness that gripped me so much as a young person, dealing with uh, anxieties and with uncertainties. I, I wouldn't say that it was replaced. You know, I'm not. I, I can claim that I'm very advanced, uh, like some experienced meditators, but, but it did let, lead me to a much more ease in the way that I experience my everyday life. I don't know. I hope, hopefully it makes sense. Well, how did you figure out, though, that you're connected to your family and to the world around you? You know, wh- why do people have a sense of disconnection and how do they reconnect? How did you do it? Besides just, bloop, you felt better. Yeah, well, that's that's a really wonderful question. So, the, according to Buddhist analysis, we are we are all experiencing ourselves, and this is embedded in us as human as uh, as selves. And this is not a problem. This is part of our programming. The problem starts when we cling to the self and see it as as much more important than what it is, just an organizing principle that enable us to function better in the world. These patterns of clinging become embedded in the way that we interact with the world. And create an illusion as if the world is is really surrounded around our our own perception of the world. The more we learn to ease it through practices, and there there are so many different practices. Um, and frankly, just reading reading some of those profound texts that give very uh, robust arguments of why this the self cannot be a substance that never changes, but it's always embedded in in a larger. Uh, larger set of processes uh, and it itself uh, made up of a lot of cognitive and embodied and somatic processes that just the, the reading about it and then 
uh, engaging some of those practices uh, like mindfulness, like learning how to be more attuned to the body and how the body is interacting with, with the world outside of my, uh, of my own sphere, open up a new way of seeing the world by which you, you feel very much connected uh, and not restricted. So the, for example, when, when I, I felt anxieties and, and disconnection, engage with some of those practices allows me to see that I'm not alone with that. And it allowed me to see some of the conditions that gave rise to those anxieties uh, in my upper grade bringing and my, uh, my culture, my family history. And very much like some trauma experts uh, are talking about today, when you see the, uh, the traumas that inform you, that made you, that condition you to, to be the person that you are, just the, uh, just the act of seeing and seeing deeply and, and in, in, in a direct experience of, uh, of you experiencing it within yourself rather than just reading about it and reflecting uh, on it, it has a, an, an, an immense healing potential that at least worked for me. Yeah, for instance, if I'm dealing with someone that's, you know, a real jerk and they're bothering <laughs> me and you know, I'm ruminating about it, et cetera, what would Buddhism tell me to do to help resolve my, you know, my angst? Well, Buddhist practice and Buddhist perspective on uh, on the jerks in our lives, uh, and sometimes when we tend to be, you know, not so kind, is to to think about the conditions that give rise to uh, this person. Take away the center from from ourselves, you know, our patterns of reactivity, our judgments, and uh, and not to allow ourselves to be bullied, but just to broaden the perspective and see the conditions from which this person emerged. Uh, maybe it's a it's it's a phase that he or she are going through maybe it's a it's a particular history that person is is carrying a, a worldview that doesn't help that or or cultural patterns that they're they're embodied and seeing that in a broader perspective allow us to tackle the the situation much more skillfully now it doesn't really negate the fact that we will have people that will behave unkindly and will be jerks and we'll, sometimes we may be jerks to others uh, but it does allow uh, plenty of openings by which we can transform our patterns of behavior and uh, allow us to react more skillfully, either um, changing our own patterns or reacting to others' patterns of behavior. It was very, very brief. I probably took like five minutes to look at Buddhism, literally, you know, a while back. And it seemed to say like, life is suffering, life sucks, just understand that and deal with it. I don't know if that's oh, like a total misinterpretation of Buddhism, but <laughs> yes. how does that figure in? That's a really good good insight to tackle because it's a view that dated to the to the first centuries of introduction to Buddhism in the West. And you know, you can read it in, uh, among thinkers like Nietzsche and others who tended to judge Buddhism as a pessimistic religion. But it's not about life being, uh, that life sucks. Uh, and, and here's some of the tradition of dealing with Buddhism that someone like me who studied that tradition and trying to communicate it to students and to others are uh, constantly struggling with. Because the terminology that the Buddhists are used are coming in, uh, from different languages, uh, more specifically in India, in, in languages like Pali or Sanskrit, and then uh, in other Asian traditions that, that Buddhism spread to, like Chinese, Japanese, Tibetan, and so forth. The terms that they are used are very different than ours. And what is usually translated as as suffering actually goes much deeper. And uh, talking about a general sense of dis-ease, right? And dis-ease can be uh, profoundly troubling that we can qualify it as suffering, but it can be just the subtle notion that everything is in flux and everything that is changing and the mere uh, the mere fact that we're clinging to to some patterns uh, as a psychological support um, and and unwilling to recognize that they too they too are changing are enough to cause us this ease in a, in, a, in a sometimes even subconscious level. So it's it's not so much a pessimistic religion. On contrary, I tend to see it as as a realistic understanding of what it means to be a, a sentient being who live in in a in a world that is a constant flux and then what are the best tools that we have to deal with that right how can we thrive in a world that is in in constant flux so the the that's the the first insight right Uh, the world is in constant constantly changing and this changing can be profoundly uh, unease for and it lead to unease for us but then uh, then you have an analysis of why this is the case right and this is the the uh, this is where buddhism identified the cause of the disease this is uh, and according to Buddhist analysis, this is caused by by patterns of clinging 
patterns of craving where we obsess over things, you know, maybe uh, in extreme cases, what we call today addiction and how to liberate ourselves from those patterns. And, and this is where dimensions of ethics come, uh, come to the, to the fore, dimensions of learning to see the world in a way that will, uh, will liberate us from those unhealthful patterns. And some of those amazing practices that this tradition developed for thousands of years that are shown great promise in, in some contemporary research about uh, implementing uh, protocols of compassion, loving kindness, um, mindfulness, etc. What, what does Buddhism give that's unique versus other religions, other faiths? So I, faith, part of the tradition, it depends, it's a big tradition uh, and it, it developed over so many different geographical area for such a long time. So it has a, an amazing diversity of perspectives uh, and faith play a role. It's the, different faith from what we usually used to in Christian context where faith is, is ascending to, to think that we cannot verify. Uh, in Buddhism, the term, the Sanskrit term is Shraddha and it connotes more sense of confidence, right? You're doing something, you're undertake a path and and you you have to trust that the path that you're on uh, will lead you to some some sort of results that you're expecting uh the the, the tradition promise uh, you have trust in the teachings of the buddha and and other teaching uh other teachers of the tradition so it's not uh it's very different from uh from blind faith and and what are, what are the unique things uh that the buddhist tradition so here here we are tapping into a an issue that I, I just want to highlight, uh, there, there are some people who tend to think that Buddhism uh, offer us something very unique that you won't find in, the, in, in other traditions. I don't tend to think that Buddhism is exceptional. And I think that as someone who studied philosophy uh, in general and not just Buddhism, Buddhism is, is in a creative dialogue with a lot of other traditions and they like Taoism and Confucianism, uh, some of the traditions that I studied at well as well. And and what, what I tend to see in Buddhism is not offering something that is revolutionary and unique because it grew up, right? It, it evolved in constant conversation with uh, traditions in India and in China and Japan, etc. And uh, these traditions learn and influence one another. What I like about uh, the Buddhist tradition is that it gives us a map. It gives us a, a framework uh, philosophically and uh, in terms of how to live uh, are to live our lives that it's that it's um, more or less cogent and coherent so if you immerse yourself in this worldview you get a very clear sense of how to improve your life and some of the tools and techniques that allows you to to implement that and to uh, and to hopefully thrive uh, in face of of a world that is so deeply relational and connected and and full with disease different kinds of buddhists like uh, you know you have denominations in christianity and you have sex and other religions, you know, reform, orthodox, whatever. Uh, what what about Buddhism? What kind of uh, creatures do you have there? Uh, absolutely. Buddhist, uh, Buddhist evolved in India. And after the Buddha died, uh, it started, we started to see divisions within the Buddhist community. And we see schools that evolve based on different interpretations of the Buddhist teaching uh, and school that uh, develop based on different interpretation of how they ought to live as a monastic community. From there, you, we see the emergence of different schools of thought other cultures that Buddhism spread through. So you have Buddhism interacting with the local traditions. Say, take for an example, the, the Chinese civilization that was a very advanced civilization already when Buddhism arrived to, uh, to China around the first century CE. And after a few centuries of, of integration, you start to see the emergence of Chinese schools. One of the most famous among them is the Zen school. Uh, which is the Chinese, the Japanese pronunciation of the word Chan in Chinese and other forms of, of Buddhism, schools like Tiantai and, and Huayan and the very popular Buddhist school of the Pure Land. Uh, and then you have the traditions that evolve uniquely to, to the Tibetan traditions where you have schools like the Galukpa and the Nyingmapa uh, and the Kagyu. Uh, and each one of them is uh, bringing uh, their own unique perspective on on how to interpret the Buddhist teaching. Well, which so, yeah, one do a, you follow most closely, and and what are like some of the um, the major divisions and some of the other types of Buddhism you've seen? As a scholar, I tend to I tend to study especially the Mahayana tradition, which is a later development that here around the first century CE in India, and then spread to uh, spread to Tibet and East Asia, and so I'm, I'm not a 
and I'm not a following a follower of one particular tradition. I tend to learn and benefit from many of them. Uh, my own area of, of intellectual interest uh, is in a school called Yogacara philosophy, a Yogacara school, uh, also known as the mind school. Yogacara just literally means practitioners of yoga. And uh, their unique perspective was to analyze the mind and argue that there are eight different kinds of consciousness that make up our, our consciousness. And they introduced a very important component, which is the storehouse consciousness, which is a unique developed for this, uh, for this school that, that um, recognized that a lot of the processes that contribute to the formation of ourselves are subconscious, right? And this is, uh, this is incredibly done uh, about more than a millennia before this idea surfaced uh, in the West with Freud. And, and that many of the tendencies that, uh, that we inform our actions uh, and the way that we think are, are emerging from potential energies that exist in that level of consciousness. Uh, and that has a lot of interesting dialogue with some of the contemporary insight that we have from cognitive science uh, and modern philosophy. So I, I, that, that's my academic focus. I'm really fascinated by the dialogue that is, you know, about several decades now, started in the 80s between uh, cognitive scientists, contemporary philosophers, and some of the people who study Buddhist philosophy like me. So who, who does Buddhism not only tend to appeal to, but seeming to help transform and improve the life of? Is, are there people that Buddhism, you know, just, it's just not their thing? And is there a common theme why? And are there people that seem to really take to it and why? Right. I think that Buddhism appealed to a lot of people. Traditionally, it appealed to, to people in, well, you know, first of all, it appealed to a lot of people in India in the lifetime of the Buddha. And then it quickly spread. In fact, it was the first world religion before Christianity and Islam uh, became religion that spread beyond the boundaries of where they uh, first evolved. So there's a long history of Buddhism appeal to population around uh, around Asia. And then in the modern period, when we start to see a global war through colonial expansion, etc., we see the emergence of interest in Buddhism in the West. It appeals to it, it, it back back then, and I still st- think I still think still today. It appealed to uh, to people who are who grew up in a Christian world, learned to see monotheism as as crucial for any moral living, and the the idea that uh, there are there are people out there that do not believe in God and still have a very um, developed philosophical view of the world and uh, and have a moral life that uh, not in, is not inferior to what Victorians uh, saw around them led to fascination for people who are not interested in, or maybe who grew apart from their uh, their own native religions in, in England at that time, uh, but also in France and eventually also in, uh, in the United States. I think that it appealed to a lot of people because of the promise for shaping our moral lives, but also our well-being. Uh, and there's a lot of hype around mindfulness that uh, that is is now practiced within or sometimes also outside of Buddhist context, and um, and a lot of excitement about how meditation can can be integrated into life of people. Uh, there, I'm sure that you know that there are many apps that uh, that help people to uh, to guide themselves into meditation, uh, and people are once they learn to know how to do it themselves could benefit from it. Now, of course, that's not a universal thing. I'm teaching, I'm teaching uh, my students and some of them are very excited to learn about Buddhism and some of them are now decided it's not for them. The, the idea that, that our self is not fixed and that ourselves are basically our, is an illusion that covering a lot of mental and physical processes is not for everybody. Some people find it very disturbing. The um, some of the aesthetics of Buddhism or some of the ideas of Buddhism, uh, other ideas of Buddhism are not appealing to uh, to people. Maybe they're not that interested in developing compassion at this point. They're dealing with other other challenges. So um, my experience that it resonates with some and it doesn't resonate with with others, and that's that's fine. There are so many many other traditions to draw on. Have you seen anyone um, use Buddhism as an overlay to their existing faith? Like are there Christian Buddhists, or they're Jewish oh, Buddhists, yeah. they're, and what does that look like, and why? There is a term uh, "jubu," which means uh, a, a Jewish Buddhist that was around uh, that is around for for quite a while, and this is partially because the many of the people that were attracted to Buddhism uh, during the sixties 
were Jewish and some of the major, uh, the, the most famous teachers in Buddhism in, uh, in that time and still today are Jewish. And they found ways to integrate and integrate Buddhism with their Judaism. Same thing for Christianity. I have a friend who was a Christian minister who practiced uh, Zen. Thomas Merton, the, the, uh, the Catholic monk who passed away in, in the 70s uh, and was, was, was great as a great influence, influence on Pope Francis, was also someone who learned a lot and uh, had a fascination with Buddhism and Buddhist practice. So, so generally speaking, Buddhism can be integrated with other religions unless you, someone is very particular and exclusive about their religious practice and identity. Um, I would say that in Asia in general, uh, you can see many people who are Buddhist and, right? So Buddhism for a lot of people in Asia is not ex- exclusive, but can be integrated with other worldview. So you can be a Buddhist and Taoist and Confucian in China, and you can be a Buddhist and Shinto in Japan, or a Buddhist and a follower of the Bon indigenous tradition in Tibet. Okay. What's the best way for people to find out more about Buddhism, to start to dip their toe in? And where can people find out more? Oh, there, there's so much, uh, so much content out there. There are numerous courses online offered through Coursera. There's a, a Buddhist studies, Buddhist studies website where uh, that offer uh, online courses. Many, many YouTube clips on o- almost every topic under the sun related to Buddhism. There are great books introducing uh, meditation practice, Buddhist philosophy. It's just a great time to, to be alive. And, and unlike my, my younger self in the 90s, who couldn't find much content, now the, the internet is just full with possibilities. Just go to Amazon, Introduction to Buddhism, Buddhist Meditation, YouTube. Uh, it's, it's very accessible these days. Okay. And where can people find out more about you as well? Oh, uh, well, you know, I, I, I didn't mention that, but part, part of uh, how Buddhism helped me was was that I, I was dealing, I, I realized later in life that I was dealing uh, throughout my whole life with ADHD. And as part of my way to, to work with, with this condition, I, I benefited a lot from meditation practices and how to allocate my attention. And one of the insights is that social media is not working well for me. So I'm not very active on social media. I have a Twitter account, but mostly uh, people can get updates from my website uh, on the Department of Religion at George Washington University. Um, an email there, always happy to talk to people. Yeah, and then I sometimes do do tweet. Well, very good. Uh, Ayo, thank you for coming on the podcast. And I don't know, I know it's an intro. I need to uh, to learn more about Buddhism because I don't know much, but like you said, thankfully, there's tons of resources. So, Thank you for your insights and for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was it was a real pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Good Question Podcast. Please email support at the good question podcast.com if you have any referrals to great guests for us to interview. Visit the good question podcast.com to hear more interviews. And please help us spread the word by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to this podcast.